Hello and welcome to Meeting People with me, Amal Pandey. Meeting People is a podcast where I have long conversations with adventurous, rebellious, and sometimes courteous free spirits. And today I'm super excited to have Alice Racky with me. Say hello, Alice. Hello, everybody. Alice is a business leader, an entrepreneur, a mentor, and I would say an all-round inspiration to anyone looking to make a difference and get on in life. So I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation. Alice, thanks for being here and sparing the time. Thank you so much for that introduction. That's very kind of you, (laughs) Amal. Well, look, normally I try and start these things by kind of fleshing out a bit of the personal side of things, but I think I want to come to that a bit later and talk about the mission to begin with, because what you're working on at the moment is, you know, something that obviously carries a lot of importance, not just for people today but you know for our futures as well um and effectively you're you know i'll let you explain it better but the way the way i see it is you know we have a plastic problem Mm. um and you're trying to solve that in some way now initially i i viewed the kind of idea of banning single-use plastics as a bit of a luxury belief it's something that is held by people with discretionary spending power and time, which is generally the people who have luxury beliefs. Now, what I find interesting about what you're doing is trying to accept that we have plastics, but what can we do about it to make it a bit more, you know, to to come to terms with that and tackle it without banning it. Is that a fair way of looking at it? Yeah, I think the the plastics problem is massive and there's no one silver bullet. Right. And banning it would be the one silver bullet, but it's just not realistic. We we kind of come to rely on plastics in many aspects of our life from healthcare through to food and beverage. So it's not going away and there isn't one single problem. And you'll have heard lots of people talking about like designing packaging better. Mm. Um ensuring it's made out of material that can be easily recycled um, or indeed can be reused. Um, So, yeah, there's lots of different things that can be done uh, to solve it. There isn't one single silver silver bullet, but um, the the particular focus of the business that I'm running at the moment, which is called Polytag, is on um, collecting data about the life cycle of plastics so that those brands that deal in single-use plastic can make more informed decisions. And then unlocking some incentives and ways to optimize the recycling rates of these single-use plastics. So it's really quite a small uh, part- Of a huge problem. Of a huge problem that that we've developed a solution for. Right, look, so I try and be a good citizen when I'm sort of walking down the street and I've not found a glass bottle of water but I've I've had to buy a plastic bottle of water and I finished it I'll you know maybe walk past two or three bins until I see a recycling bin and I'll put it in there uh, feeling slightly good about myself now what's really happening after that when when that plastic bottle goes in the recycling bin you know what what's the journey that typically happens with Mm -hmm. with 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 what I've just done well if you put it in your home recycling bin yeah. Uh, there's actually a much greater chance that it's going to get taken to a sorting centre and then the plastic will get bailed and then that bale of plastic will be taken to a plastics recycling centre and it will be washed and flaked and then pelletised and sold as, in in that case of the plastic bottle, our pet. Um, so it would be turned back into a plastic bottle, hopefully. If you put it in a street bin where it's likely to be covered in unsavouries and chips and yeah. what have you the the chances are it's probably just going to get burned yeah unfortunately and tell me then what it is what what's the kind of solution that you guys can you go a bit deeper into the solution that you mm. guys are trying to um help with yeah so um polytag is a, a two tag solution for labels that will be applied to single-use plastic bottles and um, the first tag format is a unique every time QR code it means every single instance of 
uh, packaging has got a unique identifier on it baked into a QR code. And that QR code uh, can be used to take consumers to a landing page where they can access information about that particular barcode. So in particular, you know, give them quite rich, hyper-relevant recycling instruction if, if the brand chooses. But the same QR code can also be used by any app to manage rewards and loyalty schemes. And our particular area of interest is in managing deposits. Right. Um, because there's th- th- this piece of legislation that is gaining traction across Europe, um, and hopefully, you know, we'll see it land in the UK called deposit return scheme. And traditionally, what that's meant is that when you buy a bottle uh, of a single-use plastic bottle, you would pay an extra 20 pence, for example, at the point of purchase, and you'd get that 20 pence back when you dispose of the bottle in a correct reverse vending machine. Right. But reverse vending machines, I mean, I could spend all day talking about, you know, why they're 1980s technology, but also super carbon intensive in the way they're manufactured and also in the way that they're maintained and, and emptied, etc. Um, they, they're also not particularly convenient for today's consumer um, who, from banking through to organizing taxis, tend to use their mobile devices. Yeah. Um, and why would you want to manage deposits on InScope containers any differently? And so that unique every time QR code that we're putting onto labels can be used by a recycling app for consumers to claim their 20 pence deposits back um, and, and incentivize more people to dispose of their plastic in the correct bins. Yeah, so you're like a bit like the old days where you would take your bottles back to mm. whoever and you'd get a you know 5p back or whatever it is. That's you, right. I didn't think you were old enough to remember that. Yeah, people well, talk I, about Corona lemonade bottles. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it from, from uh, being a kid visiting family in India and it's still a yeah. huge thing in India um, where, you know, you'll see people rooting through bins to collect them up to try and, you know, get enough to, yeah. to feed themselves at the end of the day. So it's it's certainly... It's amazing how these things can go full circle. And uh, is are you finding it? F- what what are the frustrations about doing what you do in terms of getting traction or getting people interested? Or, or have you found actually, you know, we're on it as a society, and where we want to solve this? Mm-hmm. Or do you still feel like a bit miffed sometimes when you kind of walk the street or? look around and see attitudes well i mean i think i'm pretty frustrated about um particularly the fmcg businesses that i deal with because i know we've got a solution um that could really help them get a handle on the pollution that they're creating and they're still very slow to want to even explore and engage let alone deliver deliver any of these initiatives they they're kind of waiting for government policy to drop before they feel forced to do anything uh, i think it just proves <laughs> that sustainability although it sort of seems to be top of people's agendas unless there's an economic benefit or it's going to yeah. positively impact their profits it's not not likely to voluntarily adopt any of these uh, opportunities so you're saying greenwashing shock horror yeah I, is I, a thing it's a total thing, um, and, and actually, it's a really nice segue into the second tag format that that we've developed, which is a invisible tag format that you can print all over the surface of your labels, or indeed on on your bottles as well. And uh, nobody can see it, but when the bottle is actually spotted in a recycling center by um, a piece of hardware that we've developed, but we're about to openly publish the specification for it because we think it's important that it gets rolled out. Uh, That piece of hardware in a recycling center can actually count in bottles at barcode level. And for the first time is giving the brands who we are lucky enough to be working with information they've never seen before about whether their plastic is actually in getting into a recycling center right. um, and and that i think has really big potential to you know 
stop the accusations of greenwashing that I mean even the news this week we've seen Coca-Cola and Danone coming under pressure um, this morning PepsiCo were in trouble with New York State because most of the waste that's being collected in the Hudson River has been identified as being PepsiCo's and a, a couple of other high profile brands you know there's a, a massive issue these brands are facing and they're all claiming their packaging is 100% recyclable, yeah. but they, you know, they've got no information to support those claims whatsoever. And and this second tag format that we've developed would enable them to know how many of their bottles are actually being recycled. It's a low cost solution. Wouldn't really take too much uh, adjustment to their label design because the tag formats are invisible, and yet they're still really slow to want to come to the party. It feels part of the problem is that your solution sounds like a simple, clean one. And in this world of kind of ESG that we live in, you have this tyranny of disclosure where you see these ESG reports that companies disclose and they're sort of 70, 80 pages long. Of that, that if I was being conspiratorial um, with a tinfoil <laughs> hat, are written to precisely at such a length so that no one reads them. Mm. And they're kind of put, <laughs> put in with such jargon that, you know, they're indecipherable. And um, and it, they're not it, based on any facts. They're, they're based not, on they're, averages. And <laughs> they're based on averages and they're designed for consulting firms, written by consulting firms, and they're designed for analysts, you know, a new ESG roles in investment firms and wherever it might be. Um, whereas if you had simple data, this is how many bottles we produce, this is how many are consumed, and this is how many last year were recycled, this is mm. how many this year recycled, and this is what we're aiming for next year. Yeah, it's pretty Simple. uncomfortable, right? One page, <laughs> yeah. done. And, you know, simplicity is often kind of the enemy of, of getting, you know, big organizations getting stuff done because things are done by committee. And and, what, and the truth, right? Because that's the issue, right? Simplicity yeah. is one issue, but knowing the truth about how how your recycling rate actually is. Yeah. <laughs> it's potentially really uncomfortable for some brands. Like yeah. we, we have had those conversations, you know, where we've said within a region, we could tell you what your recycling rate is based on your distributed sales. Yeah. And then the next point is, what if we don't like it? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the point. <laughs> At least you'd be able to yeah. go, move forward with some information to help you develop a strategy to sort it out. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of a conversation I was having with Matt on the train about tracking my own app because I work for myself and I realized I do this with a friend, a mutual friend of ours, Faisal, um, where we track on a daily basis our output in terms of sales, reading, writing, admin, which are the kind of four key things that I, I judge myself on, let's say. And I've only this year started going, actually, I need to figure out how much of this I'm actually doing to see whether, you know, where, where there are improvements, where there aren't. And it's actually very scary how <laughs> when you shine a light on something, you think you're doing lots, but actually mm. you're doing a lot less. Yep. Admin being the one that is unsurprisingly the one I least focus on. But it's it's been terrifying looking at it, but now I can do something about it. Absolutely. Right. I think and that's then maybe the next year can, you know, be a bit better. Mm. So are there, is there anyone you want to, you know, this is a, you know, we're in the UK and I'm guessing you're talking to UK brands. Is there, is there anyone that you want to maybe single out for praise or think has been a bit more forward thinking about this that you're trying to deal with? Or do you think the sector as a whole is coming together in this sort of circular economy recycling technology business do you, or? well i've got to shout out that um, polytag's got three major brand partners which we're very proud to be working with so we're working with acardo who are the uk's largest online grocery retailer and uh, we're working with aldi i think they're third biggest yeah. in the world uh global retailer and we're also working with a team at co-op and all three of those businesses fair play have stepped forward and taken a risk uh, working yeah. with a relatively small startup we are a small startup but they can see that we are on a journey and they can also see that the data they'll be able to collect with with our tools um, and the incentives and optimizations they'll be able to sort of deliver to improve their plastic packaging recycling rate 
are promising. So yeah, I'm, I must single those three yeah, out. Shout out to Co-op, Aldi and Ricardo. Ricardo. If you want to sponsor the pod, then uh, <laughs> what, you know where I am. <laughs> Alice, you can hook us up. Shameless. <laughs> um, so what's it like running a business, running a team, keeping people motivated? Is this something new to you? And how are you finding it? Oh, I'm loving it. It's the best job I've ever had. And I've spent my most of my career in big corporates. So this is a real change moving into as this, the land of startups. Um, and it's also a change in terms of my focus because I was previously always working in retail, digital retail. And now, of course, I'm in real hotspot sector with yeah. this recycling gig that I've <laughs> found myself doing. And I'm, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. But I think the the reasons I'm enjoying it are actually the same. As I've always loved managing people and working within a team. And I've always enjoyed complex problems and processes that that have a kind of pace to them, that, that move quickly. Yeah. And so those three things were true when I was working in large corporate digital retail spaces and they are also true in the land of recycling startups so yeah I'm I'm really enjoying it it's great um but you I'm assuming you know 21 year old Alice didn't know how to do tackle complex problems in such a way so how do you what advice would you give to someone who's you know been faced with us you know is either been promoted or is looking to get out and do something similar to you how do you take these things on board is it is it a lot of trial and error or is it a lot of planning is it long hours is it all of the above well I mean there's no no replacement for hard work (laughs) that's for sure I've always had quite a strong work ethic right it's stop or go there's nothing in between I think that's probably quite common um to people that that have got to the point where they they can unknot tricky problems you know yeah. because when you put the hard work in it means that you are able to unlock new information in whichever way your brain works I mean some people like to do a lot of reading and research and and other people and I'm definitely one of these people like to talk yeah and and meet people meeting people yes that's why you're here um exactly and i think you know uh, i've had a lot of conversations and and i've learned a lot from people who i've been fortunate enough to work with and meet along the way so yeah activity and hard work allow you to to gain knowledge insight information in in the way that you you learn best so you can draw on this kind of ecosystem of experiences but also people yeah, I've got I've got yeah. a lovely network that I've built yeah. up over my twenty years working in various roles, and I appreciate them very much. And there's still people that I worked with, you know, right back when I was twenty one that I'm in touch with, and yeah, um, I've yeah very much appreciated them passing on their expertise and knowledge, and and I've done my best to learn from it. Mm. Well, networking is something that I I think is so important. I I've I love doing it and I know people hate doing it and it's something that just doesn't come naturally to them and it's seen as a kind of necessary evil. Do you have any advice to people in that camp who don't, I mean, who don't see the value in it or because uh, the reason I ask is, you know, if if people should follow Alice um, on social media, particularly on LinkedIn, because you are just everywhere. (laughs) <laughs> it's phenomenal you're like you're at the you know the grocery packaging awards one evening and then you're at the recycling center you know sense of yeah. doing you know t- with a high vis jacket on and a hard hat only got, follow me if you're interested in recycling well <laughs> it's you a bit know, tedious otherwise re- well recycling or just getting sh- you know shit done you know it's, a, it's quite <laughs> nice to see um yeah over and above you know you, social media particularly linkedin is full of humble brags and you know, look at me, this, that, and the other, but without much meaning in there. But you, you, you come across genuinely authentic in terms of, you know, identifying meaningful problems and wanting to get them solved. But you're also, you're out and about and in amongst it. And Thanks, Samuel. It's quite, it's, it's quite refreshing 
That's actually also, um, one of our values at Polytag. Get right. shit done. Get shit done. We've got a Venn diagram. There's right. three things on our values Venn diagram. Get shit done is the first one. Uh, have fun yeah. is the second one. And, um, oh my God, I forgot what the third one is. <laughs> Get shit done. Have fun. Dream big. Dream big. <laughs> How can well, I forget that? Well, that's because it's so obvious. And then, and then in it. the middle, it just says people I like to work with. And so, you know, that we've, we've had that as our, that Venn diagram has been our uh, WhatsApp group icon since the beginning. Yeah. And if you, if you can't subscribe to that set of values, then you're not welcome at Polytag. Because <laughs> no, we definitely do like to get shit done, that is for sure. Well, one source of frustration um, I've had doing what I do um, over the last couple of years is, you know, one of the things I love doing is talking to, to people who are running businesses or trying to do something in a, innovative or different that intuitively maybe doesn't make sense to a rational minded person. And then by help them, I try and help them get funding to, to, you know, to be able to pursue whatever it is they're trying to do, whether it's a project or a business or a stuff. And the, the, the landscape is just so challenging in terms of interesting ideas getting funded. Mm. Have you found that? Do you spend more time than you'd like on the kind of actually trying to get people to back you from a well? I think and is the could the UK be a lot better than it is? And I think I know the answer to that. Yeah, but I'm te- but you know, yeah, we yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've spent the last twelve months trying to close our seed round. I'm happy to say we are about to. We've managed to complete the round and get enough investors on board and prepared to. Yeah. commit and back us but it is tough yeah it's tough particularly for us because i think a lot of our catalysts for growth are linked to legislation and the government has been you know so uh reluctant to to lock in legislation around like packaging extended producer responsibility or deposit return scheme yeah. but there's been real lack of certainty and nothing's crystallized. And so it's been difficult for a business like Polytag that, you know, some of the tech we provide would would definitely be uh, is more successful if there was legislative catalysts right. sitting behind it. So that's made things tough. But, um, but shouldn't the brands n- not need <laughs> legislation? You would think, right? But I've been to so many events where I've heard, you know, large soft drinks brands... Uh, representatives sit on a panel go you know sort of wringing their hands and saying oh god if if only the government would tell us what they want us to do we would be able to you know then make arrangements to sort out this single use plastic issue you know (laughs) I just think just do it yourself but you know they they, that's my point there unless there is a real sort of economic drive it's um yeah, I guess it's difficult for them to sell things in. Like sustainability is a cost center for all businesses. Yeah, it's not seen as a value driver, and I, I know that there's got to be a a big realignment of the way that businesses think about resources, and in our case, packaging, because what we what we're basically asking them to do is move from this linear take make waste model to one that's circular, either because it's designed better for reuse or because we can recycle it more effectively. And and that move, that move to circularity requires a real rethink about the economics and the way the money flows. Do you think the cu- cu- customers or the consumers of packaging are still not, you know, despite all the David Attenborough, you know, documentaries and, you know, it feels like, there was a huge push a few years ago about, you know, sustainability in, in companies. Has it kind of tapered off a bit or is there not enough pressure? You know, if if X, Y, Z, uh, let's say, let's take a hypothetical uh, soft drink brand, let's call it Boca Bola, um, you know, <laughs> genuinely felt like we're going to sell fewer bottles if we don't, take this seriously it's like we better do something ourselves rather than wait for legislation yeah so is is it partly the consumer's fault for not being pushy enough um with their with their choice of preferred you know soft drink producer oh it's chicken and egg i mean you know how easy is it to buy water that's not in a plastic bottle when you're on the go you know yeah it's just really 
it's just harder, isn't it, to remember to bring your flask with you. And yeah. So it's a bit of both, really. Mm, I think the, the key thing, though, is trying to change behavior um, through something maybe like incentives. Yes. And that's what a deposit would do. Because at the moment, when you buy a bottle of fizzy drink, you buy it for the fizzy drink. You don't buy it for the packaging. Packaging's got no value to you. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the packaging's got no value to the brand once they've sold it. Right. But what, what we're trying to do with this transition to circularity is say, you know, actually packaging has a value at all points in the supply chain. And every moment during that circular journey of that bottle, there has to be some representation of value, some way of yeah putting a putting a cost on you're kind that. of extracting in dreaded economic models you're extracting some sort of consumer surplus that's there latent yeah. and that would drive be behavioral unlocked. change yeah. yeah and gamifying it in some way yeah. so that you can like go oh, this month i've you know recycled x amount and actually yeah. it's happening faster when i buy this one versus this one or it's this company's not doing it as much as this one so maybe i should drink more of this and you know information data drives behavior and so does financial incentives yeah that's basically what it boils down to (laughs) yeah i mean i i very much on the funding thing find culturally here there's not enough of uh people obviously think about how much money can this make me what are the returns what's the kind of valuation xyz and these are people like hard numbers and I, I, I think because that brings comfort and it brings some form of accountability to an investment committee or whoever it is who's responsible for funding, you know, certain businesses. But I like to kind of flip the question on its head: is like, is this an idea that deserves being trialed in the world? Right? Is this something that is it probably won't work? It might work. It might not. But a bit like fusion or. Sp- <laughs> Sm- small modular nuclear reactors or something is this something worth trying yeah if it goes wrong what's the cost probably minimal uh but is it useful information not enough people think like that because I've, it strikes me as polytag is something that you know yeah we're a, ris- a go yeah we're a yeah. very risky vc punt right and and yeah. we've been really lucky to find those teams that they they would call themselves impact investors that that recognize that there's a lot of risk associated with coming in at this stage of Polytag's journey. But I think they also, to some degree, are excited by giving us a go and, and, and want us to be tested and want us to be out there because even if it's not Polytag that succeeds in, you know, transitioning a small part of the problem towards a more circular economy, somebody else will, off the back of what we have yeah. tested and developed, achieve it at some point in the future. Yeah, and use, <laughs> use whatever mistakes you've made mm. as, as, as um, invaluable information. Obviously, I'd love it if they that didn't happen and you guys yeah know, yeah are, I, I have every intention of making sure we are the company that makes it happen yeah. but I, I know it takes a particularly special type of vc investor yeah. to to take a punt on an organization like us so i just want to ask you just um asking for for a you know a friend let's say not actually genuinely not not even on, on, on my behalf and you'll understand why but you you're you're running a business, a startup. You're you, you, you're you're here, there, and everywhere. You're also a, a mother of kind of two adorable children, by the way. <laughs> might, I, might I might I throw in? Um, what's that like? What's it like adjusting from being a mum to being, you know, a leader in not just in the home but outside the home and have you found being a mother has made you a better business person as being a business person made you a better mother? Um, mm. And, um, or is it, is it actually just a huge challenge and th- there's too much stacked against women to be entrepreneurial leaders and it, we need to be better at empowering, incentivizing, um, normalizing um, 
women, particularly not you know not, not just women who don't want to run, have a family, but women who are you know you know with with young families to to, to go and you know fulfil themselves in multiple ways. Mm. That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I've got an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. And um, phew, I don't really know where to start. Um, it's a massive topic. Mm. Um, just some general reflections, though, is that motherhood doesn't happen all at once. It's actually a very sort of gradual process. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's important... When I look back, at least, I mean, maybe didn't feel like this at the time, but when I look back, uh, I feel that I had a a chance of managing the transition from not having children to having children and a job in in quite a gradual way, just because I made a few key decisions. Um, one was, and and these were just right for me, right? I, in case that's saying everybody's yeah. different. But one decision I made was that I took the full maternity leave with my first child. And that was a sort of a more gentle transition um, from from being a working woman to being a working mother. And then another thing I did, which sort of made the transition perhaps gentler, was that I spent some time being a freelance consultant and affording myself quite a lot of flexibility about what jobs I took on and and how and when I worked. Yeah. And um, I was also lucky that I could afford some childcare to buy myself some additional headspace and time. Hours, yeah. Yeah. To think about, you know, what, what do I want to do next? What's the right way of me sort of feeling fulfilled? Um, now I've got this most important responsibility. Um, so yeah, there's, there's sort of gradual time and the, the, the sort of transition phases when I first became a mum, I think were quite key to giving me that opportunity to like transition. Um, and then, yeah, I just, I, I guess I always knew I wanted to go back to work as well. And so if you've got that core feeling that it's it's what you want to do then you're able to make choices um and be positive in yeah in the decisions that you make but you've you've not you've not just gone back to work you've gone back to run a startup yeah yeah and be all over the country and probably work very long hours of various parts of yeah the but I but I absolutely have boundaries as well and I right. think that's something that's important so I don't work at the weekend yeah and um I don't work in the mornings when I've got my children at home before they go to school um and I think those moments allow you to feel okay about working very hard when they're at school um, and in the evenings when they've gone to bed, um, because I want to, I love yeah. my job. I mean, I love my kids. And so when I'm with my kids and I'm fully focused on them, I'm not distracted, but when I'm working, I, you know, as I said at the beginning, I've got to stop or go. It's two modes, you know, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, it, gray zones. It, it almost feels like you had to go to a startup, not had to, but <laughs> there aren't that large companies that, you know, have, are slower to shift culturally i don't know i've never worked at a big company but i suspect that you know you almost you know work, working in a startup is a kind of act of rebellion and i'll come back to that <laughs> later and you you have to and so is flexible working is a kind of almost an act of rebellion to yeah the 90s and noughties and the hustle culture that we're, we're we're kind of oh but covid helped a lot as well right yeah. i mean that actually has to be mentioned that I was on maternity leave and sort of making this transition from career woman to working mum and COVID happened in between. Yeah. And so there's a lot that needs to be sort of credited in terms of like the change of style and that flexibility and work where it works for you. I think it's, yeah. it's had a big impact. Positive one, actually. Yeah, because, you know, video technology has been 
good enough for long enough, but it was always seen as a weird thing to suggest yeah. a video call. It's not now, is it? Yeah, Everyone's and now, de facto way of doing well, it's, business. It's, you know, you, obviously there are things you lose by not having a face-to-face, but you capture 80% of the benefits 100% of the time, you know, when when you can when you can have a remote mm. and it's a shame it took a you know global pandemic to teach us that lesson mm. but it's empowered you know a lot of people to create value in a way that's not the narrow predefined societal norm of creating value totally, in a yeah. kind of corporate setting um and it's also i guess enabled you to run a a high-flying technology business from North Wales, which is... Yeah, North know. Wales, woo! <laughs> um, it's actually... It, it, London, no, where I live, um, it's got the most startups per capita than anyone well, that, else in that, the UK. Moving to London in itself is an act of rebellion, which has automatically earned you a podcast invite, <laughs> um, which we could it's talk It's great. About. <laughs> Everybody should come and visit. Yeah. We've got, yeah, we've got amazingly high Wi-Fi speeds. We've right. got uh, sea and mountains on our doorstep. Yeah. And plenty of ice cream. Like, what is not to like and if lots you're of running startups. a startup? Yeah, yeah, it's um, weird. Yeah. There's a there's a really interesting vibe in Clandidno. A lot of entrepreneurial people. Uh, they're sort of, um, yeah. <laughs> it's just a great culture up there. I really like it. And an ecosystem. And like, like, wow, who mm. knew? Or maybe if I ever launch a venture capital firm. Yeah, well, you, you also have to believe in dragons, right? I have to, to believe live in, in dragons. <laughs> Which actually, um, having a two and a half year old daughter is a lot easier to do because Zog and all exactly. other dragons are kind of very in vogue at the moment. You would be very welcome. <laughs> so there's a question that I like to um, wrap up with or um, that I ask all guests, which I call the long bet. Um and the long bet is basically something you have a 10 year time frame and it's something that you think will happen over the next 10 years or that you would or you have a choice or something that you would like to happen or both if you if you have if you have to and why is it 10 years well it's you know it's it's soon enough for it to kind of um you know matter but it's not so far away that you know you can hide in it and never be made accountable so when i next year have, have you on the pod we'll, we'll, we'll kind of pick you up on how, how it's kind of going but what what do you think something over the next 10 years that you would like to happen or you think is going to happen positive or negative hmm. okay well continuing the theme of polytag yeah which is obviously focused on solving the single-use plastics crisis, or at least a small bit of it. I would like to think that in 10 years' time, we would be a little bit horrified about how much single-use packaging we used to handle (laughs) and throw away, away wherever away is. (laughs) Um, Well, into the ocean, pretty much. Well, yeah, yeah. pretty much. I mean, everyone says, I'll throw it away, but, you know, it goes somewhere. Either gets burned or buried, mostly. Um, And it's just so prolific. There's so much of it. And it's just getting more and more and more. And you just think, when will we get to peak disposable packaging and start to realise that we have to dial it back and, and find alternatives, you know? Well, so I'd like to think that that will so we'll, be the case. So we will be of a mindset where we looked back and, you know. We're like, oh, God, I, do you remember when you used to go and buy your lunch and you used to have to buy, yeah. you know, a sandwich box and a disposable bottle of water and a packet of crisps that you just, you just used to chuck it all in the bin? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's akin to, you know, it is akin to looking back and, you know, wasn't it weird that we kept slaves? Yeah, you know, that's that, well, was that, like, that was like <laughs> wow. Yeah, know, but I mean, exactly. It that was kind totally of normal at the time. Normalized, yeah. It is normalized um, now. The single-use packaging thing, yeah. But if, and, I, and I'd like to think in ten years' time we have really started to challenge ourselves and and looked very carefully at like wow, like is this is this okay? Yeah, and the slope. So you think the slope of the curve? You're optimistic that 
over the net at some point let's say between year zero and year five we would hit the peak of the slope yeah let's hope so and and so that's actually a really optimistic way to kind of think about it and that in 10 years we'll be like looking back and going crikey um thank god we're not doing that anymore yeah yeah um and all thanks to people like you who are kind of you know hustling away trying things experimenting in our own little corner and people who (laughs) people who back you and people uh backing other businesses trying to do something similar like you know can only take my hat off to that and hopefully um by enabling you to kind of come on here and talk to talk to me about it it'll you know i've I've tangentially helped in some way as well but it's been a ton of fun thanks seeing you catching up talking to you and would love to do it again soon oh thanks for having me it's been a great chat brilliant thanks so much (laughs) 